Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. And this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. <laughs> it, you know what it is? It's a chapter-by-chapter chapter study of the Word of God. It's a narrative that drives our experience. And we got our whole Bible back, and we're almost uh, to the end of uh, the Bible this, this, for this season of time, and we're going to start right over in Genesis when we're done with this. Because our lives are changed, every one of us. We get testimonies all the time of lives changed by the morning light messages, chapter by chapter. The Father says today that he is opening the matrix of apostolic government upon the earth. A new governance is emerging in the earth, says the Father, and it's shouldering its way in the midst of the systems of this world, and it's making itself known. The world of religion will defer to this governance. The world of the marketplace will defer to this government. Media shall bow the knee to my apostolic governance that is coming forth in the earth. And I'm bringing forth a, a new breed, says the Father, a new breed of roaring reformers that will speak with boldness. And their boldness will be trembled at. It will cause the hearts of men to tremble because that which comes in the wake of their boldness, says God, will be con confirming with signs, wonders, and miracles as I once more shake the earth and shake the heavens to remove those things that can be shaken, that those things that cannot be shaken shall remain. I am vacating thrones. I am vacating principalities. I am vacating powers. And it will detonate. There will be repercussions in the spirit. There will be repercussions in the heavens. And there will be repercussions upon the earth. And man will bow the head. And he will close his eyes and say, I don't understand what's going on, but something different has come forth, says the Father. For an apostolic governance is emerging in the earth that the church, my people, will be unable to marginalize and the world will be unable to ignore, says the Father. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your word. Glory to God. If you tuned in couple minutes late, you'll want to go back because Russ started prophesying from the get-go. You don't want to miss the word of the Lord. Today, we're studying James chapter 4, identifying friendship with the world. In this chapter, James identifies for us underlying forces at work in the world to draw us away from our faith in Christ. The world around us and its representatives demand to be the center of our attention because when they cause you to become the center of their attention, that means you won't see what they're doing behind your back. So when you choose to live for Christ, you will come under subtle and at times not so subtle pressure to make room in your life for the world and its demands and its initiatives. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is spoken to strongly in this chapter. So ask the Father to allow you, give you the insight to, uh, like Jesus said, he that hath ears to hear, in other words, it's more than just what's being said on the surface. Jesus mm -hmm. is, was saying when he would say that is ask the Lord for the, for the grace to hear the resonance of the spirit mm -hmm. in what is being said. And in this 
case, applying it to our chapter today, if you'd begin by reading the entire chapter. <clears throat> James 4, verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity, en enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he said, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Wash your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy into heavy, to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save to, and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? <coughs> go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go to, into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and, and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a, va a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings, in all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So in verse 1 of James 4, the writer seeks to expose the broader causality, the reason for quarrels and contention as arising from the sin nature of man, specifically the desires that drive us. He points out that he points out many things <clears throat> that men enter into strife over are denied them because they do not take their needs to God in prayer. And it's very interesting because he says these things come of the lusts that war in your members. You lust and have not. Lust is an inordinate affection. It's more than just sexual in connotation. It's an inordinate desire, but yet makes the plain statement that you don't have because you're not asking. So there are things that become sanctioned because you're asking God to meet the need rather than dealing with the problem. Really deep understanding there that we, you, you are not going to perceive if you just look at these issues with just a knee-jerk response and only discerning it on the surface. You understand there, there are things in your life that... A religious mentality would tell you, well, that's not even justified. You can't ask for that. That's not something God wants you to have. But if you would submit that <clears throat> to God, that which is illegitimate becomes sanctioned and actually answered because you're not out there trying to wrangle and trying to manipulate and pull every lever and push every button to get your way, but you're simply bringing it in humility to God and God says, granted. Mm -hmm. So we often have not because we ask not. We pray and we do not receive because we're asking amiss. In other words, our prayers are like a misfire. What does that mean to ask amiss? To ask amiss is to ask for something that p panders to our lower nature. Perfect example of that is what I talked about yesterday or the day before. The guy who, one of our mentors, who was asking 
God, I need $2,000. He, he, it was a, something that was to meet a desperate need. And uh, so the $2,000 came in and he's jumping up and down. And he said he was literally in midair when the Lord asked him the question, are you rejoicing because you got the $2,000 or because you don't have to trust me for it anymore? Do you see? So there's the inordinate desire of not wanting to deal with the unique pressures of faith being the substance of things hoped for while you're waiting for that to become manifest substance. And the flesh doesn't like to wait on God. The flesh doesn't like to commit to God's process. We just want outcome. Give it to me. Give it to me now. Oh, God. (laughs) That's inordinate affection. So there's much unrest among people because of a lack of contentment in life. I love what Paul says. He says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Kitty and I, we've lived out of our car and we're not living out of our car now. Thank you, Lord. And guess what? We were rejoicing in the Lord when we were parked (laughs) back behind a little white uh, steeple church in rural uh, Missouri, just off Highway 13, eating egg salad sandwiches. Yes, we were. (laughs) And uh, wondering where we were going to sleep that night. We were content. Mm -hmm. There wasn't something wrong with our our relationship with God in that situation. We weren't crying, saying, why God? See, the lessons, Paul said, I know how to be a base. I know how to be a bound, because it's one singular lesson. It's how to stay in love with Jesus in the midst of the pressure. Because being abased has its own pressures. Guess what? Abounding, the pressures of abounding are more brutal than anything you can imagine. If you feel like you've been, about been wiped out by what you don't have, let me tell you something, you'd be destroyed by the intense pressure that comes from getting what you do have need of. That's right. You need to know that. That's right. Of all the pressures and the and the warfare that we have had in our lives, the one that has been most brutal, the one that has been most critical is that pressure that arises when grappling with the um, ramifications of a prayer answering God. So the pressures of success, folks, that people who, who never understood how success works They think, when I'm successful, I won't be under pressure. You don't understand. When you're successful, the pressures are much more brutal. And if you can't take it, it's like in the situation that you're in, what are you going to do? You would not survive. So we need to learn how. Uh, Listen, my heart is God give us a tribe of people who want to learn how to embrace that process. Because when you embrace that process, the parameters of your life will utterly change. And you will walk in to a level of power and provision in God that will cause the mountains of the earth to tremble because the enemy in resisting you only furthers the initiatives of the kingdom that are coming about because he dared to touch what belonged to God. But there are pressures connected with that. Mm -hmm. And if you're not prepared, like Acts 14.22 says, it says to, it is through much tribulation you enter the kingdom. The kingdom is Righteousness, peace, and joy. Entitlement. Stepping into a moment of time when entitlement in God defines everything about your life here on the earth. But you have to push through intense and massive pressure to come into that place. And if you don't want pressure, that's an inordinate desire that you need to repent of. God, I repent for rejecting the pressure that brings the kingdom. You need to pray that prayer. What's the scripture about? Running with the horses. If you can't run you can't walk with, with the footman, how are you going to run with the horsemen? Yeah. <laughs> if you can't be a foot soldier, how are you ever going to join the cavalry is what he was saying. <laughs> and you got to understand what horses represent. They represent power. They represent ego. Mm-hmm. If you can't walk with the footman, if you can't walk 
See, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If you can't walk some things out in God, how are you ever going to mount that personal power that defines your ego, that properly submitted to God and cleansed of transgression becomes the very vessel through which the unstoppable power and potency of the kingdom blasts into your life and destroys the enmity of every opposition that stands against you. But it does not come until you put a bit in that horse's mouth. Are you listening to me? This is a morning of prophesying. We are listening close. (laughs) Somebody says, I'm not sure what he said, but I agree with him. I know that's right. (laughs) (laughs) Hallelujah. So... Contentment. Materialism cannot bring peace of mind. We must give thought not to look for the things to the things of the world for the security that can only be found in Christ. When we attempt to extract from a relationship or some material acquisition that which we should be looking to God for, That constitutes spiritual adultery. Mm -hmm. If you are robbed of your peace because of the broke down beater that's in your driveway Mm -hmm. and you need to have another car and you don't have peace with God, there's an idol being exposed. If your sense of self-referral and stability, security is extracted from how much money you have in the bank, the house you live in, the car you drive, having a trophy wife by your side. You understand what I'm saying? Much of the modern concept of love is not love. It's idolatry. I will never forget when Kitty and I were dating, and I so loved her, And God dealt with my capacity for idolatry where she was concerned. And mine too. I I loved her so much that there was a danger that she would, without meaning to, I would allow my love for her to claim territory in my heart that only belonged to God. That's right. And I went through nine months of the most brutal Mm -hmm. pressure you could ever imagine laying my all on the altar. Amen. And when that when I when I came to that place that I could do that. Thank you, Lord. Then literally within 24 hours she was in my arms. Amen. Amen. So when we attempt to extract from a relationship or some material acquisition that which we should be looking to God for, that constitutes spiritual adultery. If we're going to be a friend of God, we cannot be a friend of the world, James says. Now, that word friend, it's where the Arabic word effendi comes from. You ever might have saw that on some 1940s movie, you know, where the Arabic actor addressed somebody as effendi. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with offense. It What it means is covenant partner. The word friend was used more strongly in ancient times than it is today. It carries a covenantal context. Where are our covenants? We know where your covenants are by what bleeds when it gets taken out of your life. (laughs) Wow. Are you listening? Wow. Oh, I'm wounded. There's your covenant. Mm -hmm. Is it an idol? Are you in covenant with the idol? Are you partaking at the altar of the idol? Mm -hmm. The only thing that should bleed if it were to be taken out of your life, is your connection to the presence of God and everything else, you could take it or leave it because your life is not your own. Are you listening to me? Mm -hmm. In our culture today, in the culture of our marketplace, talking about adultery, idolatry, Mm -hmm. through friendship with the world, spiritual adultery, is the the topic of conversation in this part of our chapter. In the culture of the marketplace today, many Fortune 500 companies brand themselves 
after a religious fashion, projecting to their customers a sense of tribe and belonging. One example of this, one aspect of this is what James is speaking about. Connection to the world. Examples of this would be Starbucks. Harley Davidson. You touch somebody's Harley Davidson fetish, I guarantee you they'll break relationship with you. They don't care what God says. And unambiguously so, the clothing brand, true religion. How blatant is it going to get? That these are marketplace forces and strategies that are crossing the boundary between the marketplace and religion to co-opt the faith, to take energies that are to, to be devoted to God and wanting to capture them as an expression of your own identity and who you are by connecting with that marketplace culture or that marketplace brand. Seeking to co-opt the faith of some who are going to be more faithful to their brand than they are to their church. We see people can walk down the street and they've got a Harley Davidson scarf, a Harley Davidson bag, they've got Harley Davidson pants, a Harley Davidson jacket, Harley Davidson shoes. You know instantly they are an ambassador of Harley Davidson. Can you imagine anybody wearing the name of their church like that? Wow. During the 1970s, you don't know how insidious this is. Satan uses, you may think this is just anecdotal, but Satan uses this kind of strategy to derail the very move of God when it comes into the earth. In the 1970s, in the Jesus movement, the music industry did this with songs that they themselves, and if you do some research, you'll find Music industry insiders who said these decisions were made as an overall strategy among record companies with great specificity to make what they called crossover songs to seduce believers back to the consumerism culture that they wanted them to be enslaved to by bringing forth songs like My Sweet Lord. Jesus is just all right with me. <laughs> Bridge over troubled waters. I hope I touched your idol just now. And many, many more. The market forces recognized that the Jesus movement was abandoning consumerism as a lifestyle, and they came up with these strategies to seduce them back into captivity and away from the dependence upon Christ, identification with Christ, because their newfound faith was deemed counter to the corporate bottom line. Mm -hmm. And the same strategy is being used against the church today in the political realm, with profound effects since the days of Ronald Reagan. We've lost more viewers and friends by putting our finger on that idol than I could ever account to you during the length of this broadcast, because they don't want to hear it. The message of James could not be more relevant. Friendship with the world or the system, you got to know what the world is. It means cosmos. It's an aggregate of harmonious systems making up civilization as we know it. Mm -hmm. Some people call it the seven mountains of influence. Friendship, covenant with the system is enmity against God. When you join their groups, when you wear their brand, when you use their products, and you extract something from that, that you should be only getting from a yielded relationship with Christ, that's an idol, and that would constitute spiritual adultery. Mm -hmm. So what's the alternative? James tells us, hey, submit yourself to God. 
I know a lot of submitted Starbucks customers. <laughs> I know a lot of you listen, you watch in the music industry. Just go go get on YouTube and look at some of the concerts of popular performers. You see a submitted people worshiping their idol. And they and unashamedly they call themselves idols. And the culture of celebrity has so infected Christian thinking that leaders realize that if they don't present themselves as larger than life with the smoke machines and the light displays, that they're going to lose the interest. They're trying to outworld the world. And the cause of Christ is somehow lost in the midst of all of that misdirection. Even the voice. A lot of people like the voice. I like it because we get to see some awesome talent. But think about it. People are looking for the voice when they should be looking for the voice. The one who once spoke from heaven and is speaking again, they need to be listening for the true voice of God. So what's the alternative? Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. In other words, he's defining. All of that defines what? The devil. We're not talking about somebody with pitchfork and two horns. Resist the devil in what? He will withdraw from you. Draw near to God and cleanse your way and your thinking from the double-mindedness brought on by the dual initiatives of the enemy who attempts to use these carnal strategies to co-op faith-based outcomes. The world and its systems will humble us and leave us ashamed and disgraced. When we humble ourselves to God, James says, you'll be lifted up. Mm-hmm. How many times have you seen people make fools of themselves? By humbling themselves, posturing themselves, becoming putty in the hands of the marketplace forces, abusing them through these strategies, and when they're done with them, You're only as good as your next purchase. Mm -hmm. And when they're done with you, you ain't nothing. But when you humble yourselves to God, what does he do? He lifts you up. So knowing that such statements provoke objections from those entrenched in the snare of the enemy, James follows up with, hey, don't speak evil against one another. In other words, it's just like Adam and Eve. Where are you? Well, that woman you gave me. Well, the serpent gave me and I ate. In other words, hold on now. This this is not where we play the blame game. (laughs) And what's happening in our society? Guilt. Think about this. The litigious society we live in. The tyranny of political correctness. And everybody has to approve of me. Why are people so clamoring for approval and recognition because of the deep shame and guilt that can only be cleansed in Christ? James follows up. Don't speak evil against one another. And here he continues with this reproof. He starts referring to people taking each other to court, which really speaks to the litigious society we live in today. People in our culture take one another to court for any random reason. The political correctness issue that was a nuisance And an oddity 10 years ago has become a cultural behemoth that is veritably driving our society off the rails. Nations and leaders are standing or falling. And what's the deep-seated issue? Shame. Guilt of sin. You must sit, tell me how, how good I am. Everybody has to accept me or, or, or I can't live. Because they're looking to man for what they ought to look to God for. If I allowed every criticism that we've received to impact me, one iota, there's no way we could do what we do. God told us, I'm so glad he did. He said, you cannot listen to your critics. I learned that from John Wimber. John Wimber had signed a signs and wonders ministry. Amazingly, the world yawned and the church looked the other way, uninterested. When this man would lay hands on people 
and amputated limbs would grow out right in front of it. I'm not talking about in Africa. I'm talking about in England and in the United States. When he went into the uh, ministry of, of healing, the Lord says you can't listen to your critics. So they didn't listen to their critics. And then their friends started coming to them, telling them what their critics were saying. Mm -hmm. And when they didn't listen to their friends who were repeating what the critics were saying, they lost all their friends. And this was in the midst of praying for people for two years and no one got healed. And some people who prayed for the sick contracted their diseases and died. And John Wimber was complaining to God about it. He, God said, if you don't like it, get out. John Wimber said, all the way out. <laughs> but listen, there's a word in this we need to hear today. We got to get past the breach of expecting everyone else to buttress in us that which can only be ameliorated by the finger of God on your life. Footnote, hashtag demon detox, Apostle Ricardo Watson. Amen. Jesus said, if I by the finger of God cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Mm -hmm. James' insistence is in terms of judgment, we are to first hold ourselves accountable, not taking upon ourselves the presumption of judging others when we ourselves will never do likewise in terms of we're holding people to an account, to a level of accountability that we exempt ourselves from. You are accountable to me. I am accountable to no one. Amen. See, the law of God is given to hold ourselves first accountable. Like I believe it was Paul said in Galatians, having a willingness to revenge all disobedience when your own obedience is fulfilled. <laughs> in verse 13, James warns us against making plans. And notice what he says in verse 13. He hasn't changed the subject because he's talking about going into a city, going into a market, continuing buying and selling and getting gain. He's still talking about the same thing. This entire conversation is addressing the market forces that frame society as we know it. And if you think they don't, just let a pre, uh, an EMP strike above the city of New York, wipe out the financial district and suddenly money ceases to exist. And you'll find out how relevant these things are that he's saying. He's setting up the altar of heaven in the very heart of the Antichrist territory in the things that he's saying. He's framing this statement in don't make plans without God. And he's framing this in the context of market-based interaction of buying and selling. Making everything James is saying in the context of ungodly attitudes toward acquisition, acquisition conspicuous consumption expressed in the remarks at the beginning of the chapter. The reminder for us is this. Life is a vapor. My mother... When my mother died, I'd only had one other death in my family as my grandmother when I was 12. And when my mother died, I it was just, I, I didn't spend much time in, in cemeteries. Inglewood Cemetery, Clinton, Missouri. I remember standing over her grave. And looking around at the tombstones, Civil War veterans, people from World War I, family names in my town that I recognized, all the lives of thousands of people represented in that cemetery. And the Lord said, if it doesn't matter here, it doesn't matter. You want to prioritize your life? Just go visit the grave sites of your loved ones and take a long, deep breath. And you'll come out of there a different person. Life is a vapor. Then it's gone. For this reason, every plan and initiative of life we engaged in should be wa walked out, as verse 15 tells us, in the context of God's will 
and not merely our own pursuit of pleasure and vainly trying to assuage the deep shame and guilt and the stain of sin by anything other than that altar that our high priest we learned about in Hebrews cleansed for that purpose in the heavenlies. What's it all about? To him that knows to do good. James is saying all all of this, and lest they take it as just an exercise of some intellectual conversation, he brings everybody that reads it into accountability. He says, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. So, Father, we thank you. We know that these things we see in James 4, they, they weave into the very fabric of our life. God, that you would constitute as a people that has no covenantal connection with anything other than that which is upon the altar that Jesus, you cleansed with your own blood in the heavens. Help us, O oh God, to become that people not guilty of spiritual adultery, idolatry, not captive by the deceits of the world seeking to co-opt our faith and our yieldedness to you. We so long to be that people that lives out our lives in the midst of this cosmos, this aggregate of harmonious systems we call civilization, as light and salt, purifying that which is impossibly defiled, beginning with our own hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.